Okay, hi. Um, so this will be an informational talk. Um, I'm a previous developer of these systems and for about the last year and a half, I'm now the director um, of a group, Complex and Beecher Systems Group at Genentech. So I'm happy to talk about um, separately from Genentech, I'm part of this IQMPS consortium of pharma companies that's helping to push this technology. So I'll start with some acknowledgements. Um, the IQMPS affiliate has a secretariat that does a really great job of helping all of us with things like these slides. So I'd like to say thank you to them. And they have lots of other divisions that you're probably aware of, but this particular one is an affiliate of groups that are very interested in um, MPS technology. And the idea is, but if we get together as a group um, between industry, developers, regulators, hopefully um, we can increase the pace of advancement of these technologies and into the hands of um, people who really are gonna push them forward for testing drugs. Um, a lot of the representation inside of our organization is from drug safety, but there's also 3Rs representation, ADME and PK experts. Um, a former past chair is in the room here, Jason Eckert of, of this um, consortium, current chair is Ree Hardwick. And current membership has about 20 companies representing a lot of the major pharma companies to date. Um, and each member company is provisioned two members to be on the steering committee of the IQMPS affiliate. Um, but any member from any of the companies can participate in the work streams, which I'll go over in a few minutes. Um, so quickly, I just want to mention that the MPS definition as defined by the affiliate um, in several manuscripts here um, as an intro um, is pretty much anything um, more advanced than a 2D cell culture system, usually incorporating flow. And I'll kind of back up and say that the IQMPS affiliates has a couple of goals. Um, the first is to help service thought leaders, and I'll go over that in depth. Um, to provide a venue for cross pharma collaboration, cross pharma data sharing, um, and to create engagement between industry and regulatory and really try to push this forward. I know an earlier talk in our session talked about that quite a bit. And then to develop you know, external partnerships to help enhance um, the inclusion of industrial priorities in a lot of the development. So one thing I find particularly useful is the thought leadership from this organization. So from when they were started in 2017, 2018 until now, they've done quite a bit of outreach of presentations, um, public manuscripts that really help drive um, how these systems can be um, qualified, validated, and what the industrial perspective is on how to qualify the systems um, and how, how that would be important for their processes. Um, and there's a couple of work streams that help enable all of the goals that I just talked about earlier. Um, the first one is this organotypic manuscripts work stream. Um, then we have a regulatory outreach work stream, um, a pilot team, which consists of people who are interested in actually engaging in scientific pre-competitive projects together. So we as pharma companies will get together and co-fund a study if we feel like the data from that study would be useful for all of us. Um, strategic partnerships, communication, reaching out to stakeholders across the industry. And then um, we also perform some landscape surveys to understand how are these MPS systems being utilized across the industry, across developers, understanding where are the needs currently and where are the gaps. So I'll then spend the rest of this presentation going over all of these different work streams in depth, starting with the organotypic manuscripts. So um, before, well before I joined the affiliate, there was an achievement of the 1.0 manuscripts that they, they like to call it, um, where there's nine manuscripts, as you can see here, um, lots of different topics of those first couple of manuscripts. Some of them were specific to organ systems. Um, you have a, an intro there and then some on ADME applications, et cetera. And Jason did a nice job of kind of outlining where those are available in previous talks and on our website at the IQMPS. And then um, there's a new 2.0 manuscripts now in current um, progression. There's two that have been published so far um, in this second series of manuscripts and a lot more that are to come out of the IQMPS affiliate. And I would note that all of these manuscripts typically have you know, all authors from across those, those member pharma companies. So the opinions are, are 
expressed as shared across all of those pharma member companies. And this is a lot of the 1.0 manuscript series, and you can see kind of the uh, different topics that they undertook. But I think that I wanted to kind of go back for a second to the intro manuscript because some of these messages that were written several years ago now still largely hold. Like just defining the definition of what is an MPS has actually across multiple industries been an important facet of this um, when you talk to FDA or talk to other regulatory um, engagements. Um, understanding that context of use, you know, a lot, a lot of times has been engaged in safety and in ADME, but you know, the context of use in general is super important to qualify your system. And that characterization of system is inherent to building confidence in it. Um, animal chip counterparts, I'll harp on this throughout the presentation, um, industry feels very strongly that having animal chip counterparts will really help um, give credence to the human chip results. Um, compound lists are available in a lot of these manuscripts, and as has been discussed earlier today, while it's not um, while it's not complete validation to have every compound on that list evaluated, um, doesn't represent complete qualification. I mean, um, it does give you a place to start, and it would it would give you credence to your system to say, here's my context of use, and here's my compound list that I've already tested in it. Um, gaps can be filled by MPS and the challenges that were introduced in the beginning, I think largely remain, which is, you know, money, time, resources are, are what's, what's hard by pharma to kind of uptake these systems. Um, there has to be increase in throughput, which I've seen a lot in this conference so far. So I think some of these challenges are definitely being tackled. So I'll, I'll reach out to the second one here, which is the regulatory outreach. Um, there's been a bunch of achievements in 2020 and 2021, having different workshops and webinars uh, conducted to kind of um, get people from the industry together between FDA, between um, the IQMPS affiliates and others. And then just last month, there was a workshop between health regulators globally um, and the IQMPS affiliates. And all of those are gonna come with corresponding manuscripts. So if you really wanna know what was discussed at all of these workshops, um, we always make that publicly available. And the regulatory engagement team has, has several branches and has really reached out in recent years. Um, you've got um, this webinar series that I was talking about, deeper dives in these workshops and having a lot of FDA and industry attendance, um, joint publications with FDA, some that have happened and some that are ongoing. Um, the workshop from last month, and, um, and generally engaging on what does a roadmap towards regulatory guidance look like for these technologies. This was the 2020 um, IQMPS workshop that was in person and here was the manuscript in case you wanna go back and look at it. And we'll be publishing a manuscript on what happened last month uh, as part of the workshop as well. The pilot team projects. So again, these are projects where the companies get together and define a common goal, something that we're very interested in to maybe define across you know, model comparisons um, in certain organs or particular types. And the way we go about this is the IQMPS affiliates does not or cannot endorse any one single vendor. So instead, what we do is we define a common goal we'd like to go after. And then we um, submit a request for information uh, that's open to anyone to submit to. Um, and then we down select from those, um, I just put it down here. We down select from those from that RFI release process to a request for proposal. Um, and in that request for proposal, um, we would then consider you know, all of the financial implications and then we would initiate a study. And as I kind of said in the beginning, from all the member companies, any person in the member company can participate in this work stream, not just the steering committee members that are part of the IQMPS affiliate. There are two ongoing larger projects as part of this pilot work stream right now. One of them is in GI models, and it was identified early that toxicology, toxicology biomarkers and stem cell toxicology were two really important um, facets that the committee as a whole would like to look into. And so far we've narrowed down from eight to five vendors and the RFPs are getting reviewed at this moment. 
And on the kidney side, um, we were interested to kind of join forces with CPATH and look at different biomarkers um, in renal proximal tubule damage. And so that one is also at RFP stage and is being reviewed uh, to go to proposal stage. And lastly, at the bottom here, there's also a bunch of opportunity within the IQMPS affiliate for different industrial uh, pre-competitive sharing, that, that data sharing that all of us that do model development inside industry would like to save some time um, by helping each other in that regard. Strategic partnerships and communications. So we've got a couple of those and I won't read all of these outright, but I would say that you know, we are in touch with a lot of different groups, um, Eurox, NA3CRs. Um, we would like to enhance that and ensure that these connections remain viable and stable. So if you're part of any of these organizations and you would really like to talk to us about having joint seminars or workshops, we'd be very interested in continuing to, um, to, to assess that reach here. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about the two landscape surveys that we've done. So the goal here was to identify major challenges um, to realizing the full potential of these technologies inside of industry. And <clears throat> there were two definitions put forward in the two different surveys, which makes a little bit, the, the results a little bit muddled. It's a little bit harder to understand the difference from year to year. But there was a 2019 survey where we were defining um, an MPS as with having all of these green check marks here where you would include pre-patterned and 3D micro tissues in the definition. And then latter in 2021, we only included um, printed static flow or uh, microfluidic systems in the definition. I think the idea there was to try to understand where the barrier to adoption of those latter versions really were. <clears throat> And so this team has put together several of these surveys so far, presented the results, and the ongoing activity of this team is to really publish both survey one and 2.0 uh, results, which is coming out soon, I hope. Um, and if you look between 2019 and 2021, I'd say large companies um, formed the majority of the responses in both cases, followed by mid-size and then smaller companies. The thing that I found particularly interesting was that of all the respondents, they said that their top priority organ of interest was liver, followed by gut and kidney. And then after that, there was some divergence of, of the interests. But um, that was also, it was interesting because the IQMPS affiliates had decided to go after as pilot projects, the gut and the kidney first, mostly because the liver was already being undertaken in a lot of those companies um, heavily and thoroughly um, internally. Okay, so um, the narrowed focus of the definition led to the 2021 survey having slightly less respondents, we think. Um, the decrease in number of FTEs um, associated with working on these, these particularly challenging systems was decreased slightly from 2019 to 2021, but again, it might be because of the change in definition. Um, I would say that some conclusions, the human MPS models that are used are awesome. Um, and they're used mostly in safety and in mechanistic action, MOA studies. Um, <clears throat> and really, if you look across many of the companies, they're being used largely for small molecules and kind of in that order that I'm showing here. So majority being used for small molecules more than biologics, and you can kind of move down the line here. And I think that there's still, there's still somewhat of a resistance to filing them in regulatory filings, which we're really working hard to overcome. And so what we've found a lot is that they're being used internally, but for internal decision-making and not always going into the hands of regulators um, for, for final pending like IND applications. So 2022 and beyond, um, I think there's a couple of things that we would really like to focus on as the affiliate. Um, and I think all of these things have actually been touched a largely upon today. So the idea that your um, input cells are super important no matter what device you're using. So how do, we, how do we make those a little bit more consistent? And then your context of use um, is incredibly important for qualifying the system. If you have a system, it's not just gonna be qualified for every potential use. You have to actually really narrow that definition. 
And then the animal to species translation and really pushing the idea that in, in addition to having your human chips available, we'd really like to have those animal chips on hand so we can do the in vitro to in vivo translation because pharma companies have a lot of data from their animal um, use, use cases and studies. So with that, I'd like to take any questions. Are there any questions about coming up? I do have a lot of questions, but I also don't like speakers feeling awkward that no one asks the questions. So um, can you talk a little bit about your work packages uh, in RFPs? So the idea is that the vendors will actually do the work and then you will review it rather than the third party kind of using chips and emulating what you would do yourself in the lab later if it works. Yeah, we have a quite a bit of flexibility with that. So it is mostly asking vendors to do the work in their, their own houses, but we've found that if we want to make cross chip comparisons, that's not always easy to do. So part of it you can do there, but part of it we're, at, we're imagining chipping in in kind. So, you know, if, if some of that, you know, cytokines can be sent to one lab for analysis, we might do that in some cases. Yeah. So pretty much everything I saw up there were single organ uh, systems, whereas the future really of MPS is looking at interconnected multi-organ systems. Are you going to consider those uh, in future aspects or is this not something on your radar right at the moment? Hmm. I'd say it's on our radar for sure. I'd say that, you know, we have that publication on ADME that talks about, you know, linking and things like that. So we're very aware. I think that coming from the developer side, the, the industry tends to be a bit more conservative and really wants to see the general use and qualification of individual systems, in many cases, robustly before we move on to the next thing, right? So I wouldn't say it's not coming and I wouldn't say it's not on our mind. I think we have talked about it, but it's kind of like, let's get to step A, let's do step B. That's kind of how I've, I've felt as part of the organization so far. And are you starting to couple the in silico? Because obviously in silico has been one of the big pushes for big pharma recently with the MPS systems at this point um, to be able to create the PKPD models of the in vitro systems, the MPS, and then couple it with your advanced in silico models. Good question. I haven't personally been part of discussions of that with the IQMPS affiliate, not that it's not happening though, and not that we wouldn't consider future projects on that. I think a lot of us though internally are having those discussions and are already trying to do that internally with our systems and our model development. Yeah. Hi Kim, nice Hi. talk. <laughs> um, I was fascinated by your, especially the comments toward the end about validating these models using the animal models as kind of like I guess it, I've never really thought about it, but it does make sense, you know, uh, with in vivo models. Um, is there a preference like mouse, baboon, gibbon, you know, like it, how, how would you direct, especially academic researchers to, you know, direct their funds away from a lot of the work that we still have to do within the human models um, and validation, also doing it simultaneously in a separate like uh, animal model? <laughs> Good question, yeah. It takes a village, right? So I, I, I'm hoping that developers that are making systems that pharma's adopting, that are you know, being used more scalable, more routine, all of that come up with these animal chips almost, I wouldn't say first, but in a way, for, you know, because they're, they're the ones that we can get this robust deep data set off of and then hopefully translate that because there's scaling factors we wanna understand. There's, you know, and, and towards the idea of which animal, um, that's really going to depend. So, of course, you know, mouse, rat, sino, you know, those are used routinely, but there's others too. So I would say um, definitely going to need a non-rodent and a rodent species. But um, in general, I think it's really important for us to kind of take our robust in vivo from animal data, compare it to the chip, and then be able to do that scaling to what the in vivo human, you know, dosing and, and all of that should be. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Maybe one last from my side. You mentioned these pilot projects. Yeah. Um, defined by the 
IQ consortium, are you also open for proposal coming from the outside? I mean, clearly they need to be addressing a general problem, but maybe they can be embraced and by the IQ consortium because it is really kind of something of general interest. <sighs> That's a hard one because legally we have a lot of restrictions given okay. that we are yeah. affiliate and we can't then just say, I, I would like this one vendor to this one thing for me. But at the same time, actually, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to punt that one. I actually don't know the answer to that question, okay. really, yeah. um, because I haven't seen it done. And where I have seen it done, it's always an open call. So yeah. even if the idea came from somewhere else, I think it would still have to become an open call. Okay. Like, yeah. you know, for, for yeah, anyone I mean, to it, participate. It would be basically just the idea. I think a certain vendor would need to step back and say, okay, we are confronted with that question from, let's say, end users. Mm. Why do we not do a larger study that is kind mm -hmm. of comparing a lot of different systems right. based on that, what we kind of experience and then approach the IQ consortium and kind of say, okay, from our perspective, this could be interesting also including the vendor itself, but kind of in a general context. And yeah, yeah. And those are the types of things we want to do. We yeah. want to do the pre-competitive data gathering, comparing multiple systems exactly. and knowing where the pluses and minuses mm -hmm. are for each of them. That's what helps us all move forward. Yeah. Um, so if you have a good question, I'm sure if you brought it up to any of the steering committee members and then the steering committee members can, can you know, propagate. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. great.